We give a welcome to those who are worshipping here this evening, and we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Richard Jurd to lead our service. So we're having a bit of a compromise with the communion. We're still having the, the plastic combined um, elements, but they're going to be brought to you in the tray, so it will be similar to how we've done before, except both will come at the same time, the bread and the wine in that. Um, again, I would remind you that um, it's a lovely evening to try and socialise outside rather than inside. Um, I think that, um, Richard will probably go to the door outside and then you follow him and talk there. <laughs> we hope there's only one more week of this confounded situation um, before we have a bit more freedom to be ourselves in the place of worship. I invite you to stand now as we commence worship. Let us worship God. Jesus said, this is my commandment, <coughs> that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all time and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through meditation and silence, through the words of hymn and address, through the whisper of prayers, through the reading of the Bible, and by the presence of the Spirit, may this time together be both challenge and comfort, and all to the glory of God. Let us pray. Please be seated. O oh, living and loving God, once more on this summer evening, we come to praise you and to worship you in this, your house. We come as we are, men and women, different ages, different life histories, different hopes and expectations, different experiences, Take us now, fill us, strengthen us, and inspire us. Through our service of worship, may we be recharged with your Holy Spirit. May we be strengthened and guided. And may we come to know you more closely and be better equipped to go out from this place to live as your disciples in your world. This we pray in the words of Jesus, who taught us to pray, and we say this together quietly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're still not allowed to sing, unless you happen to be a football fan, in which case you can join with thousands of others bawling your head off um, while you swig beer. But sadly, we can't do it in church. But then I wouldn't know anything about that because I'm a retired professor of immunology and don't know anything about those sort of things, do I? <laughs> anyway, having made that rather crabby point, um, uh, can I say that our first hymn, which will be sung for us, is number 43, if you're following it in the hymn book, I sing the almighty power of God. Number 43. <laughs> Oh. 
Now a prayer of confession, and I'm using words from the United Reformed Church Prayer Fellowship Handbook, uh, words of Anne Honey. There are times when we disappoint ourselves, when our behavior and thoughts come between us and the person we want to be. Often we make excuses. I couldn't help it. I didn't know. There were circumstances. We don't manage to fool ourselves and we don't fool you. We long to live life in its fullness, but we are very good at sabotaging our own efforts. Lord, we rise only by the strength of your forgiving hand. Your grace lifts us back to life and we can live more honestly knowing that you love us always. Take our lives, forgive us, and lead us into a better day. Amen. Here are words which we may trust, words which we believe are true. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To all who repent and resolve to lead a new life, he says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, take up your cross and follow me. We hear now from the Bible, and Val will read our first lesson, which comes from St. Mark's Gospel. The first lesson is taken from St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, beginning to read at verse 24. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered her house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman, whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician of origin, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon had gone. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decap Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephrathatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well, and he even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Here ends the first reading. We now turn back to the Old Testament, and I'll ask you please to, in your hymn books, Turn to Psalm 100, which you'll find as 711, 711, and I suggest that we read this quietly together. Um, I'll read the antiphon and uh, the bits that are in light type, and ask you please to read the two verses that are in bold. It's the 100th Psalm, the old 100th, and it's number 711. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. 
Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Amen. And finally, from the Bible, we hear words from the book of Acts. The reading is taken from Acts chapter 10, beginning to read at verse 1. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon, at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God hath made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. And the things were suddenly taken up to heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for those readings. Thank you also for your invitation to lead worship here at chapel this evening. Goodness, it was last March when I was last here, just before the first lockdown, and it seems a very long time ago. And although I've met and talked with some of you since then, um, it's good to be here meeting you uh, to worship. I led worship at Whiting Street, Bury St Edmunds, this morning, and they send their greetings to you. And I also acted as the anchor man at Coral Evensong at Lion Walk this afternoon. <laughs> so greetings too from Lion Walk. Um, I hope I can survive three services. <laughs> Uh, Liz told me very strictly that I was only allowed to take one service on a Sunday uh, when I'd reached my three-quarters century. <laughs> and Liz also sends her regards. Um, she's uh, a little unwell at the moment, um, something called reactive arthritis. She's got the gene that causes it, and at the moment she's using a wheelchair and crutches. But um, things seem to be on the mend. Uh, we had it 17 years ago, and she made a total recovery. And... Um, uh, we're hoping that this will be a repeat performance, but it is a little bit slow. But she sends her love and her regards to you all. <coughs> and I hope that also when we can meet a little bit more normally, she'll be able to join us as usual. I imagine that all of us like to feel that little bit exclusive, that little bit exceptional. 
we really like to feel that we are sometimes an elite. An exclusive deal for premier clients only. Members parking only. First track for business, fast track for business class passengers. Oh, if only I absolutely detest flying. Use of our VIP lounge. HSBC Premier Account Customers fa Fast Track Helpline, which gives you an opportunity to listen to about 45 minutes of Vivaldi played on a synthesizer, <laughs> and so on. Um, or something, perhaps, that uh, removes us a little from everybody else. The hoi polloi. You'll be learning Greek. Um, uh, the plebs, the vulgar herd, although, of course, we never put it as snobbishly or as crudely as that, would we? I imagine it's only human nature. I'm as bad as everybody else. I remember, oh, goodness, nearly 60 years ago, paying a five-shilling supplement to travel, a uh, third class, on the steam hall Bournemouth Bell from Waterloo to Southampton when returning from university at the end of term. Uh, round about 1964, and sitting in a Pullman carriage, which had a frilly lampshade uh, on the um, electric light that was on the table, and uh, watching with some sense of superiority other passengers boarding the filthy green everyday carriages of the routine trains on the Waterloo to Weymouth line. All for five shillings. We know that exclusiveness, exclusivity, was an issue for the first followers of Jesus. And it was even something that must have presented a challenge to Jesus himself as he developed his ministry. Jesus was a Jew, and as far as we know, all his first followers were also Jews. They were steeped in the traditions of their religion going back for many centuries. The Jewish people were special. They were God's chosen people. The Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron smelter, out of Egypt to become a people of his very own possession, as you are now. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And that reflects the even older words from Exodus. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. And Jesus' early ministry was to his own people. We know from the earlier chapters in the Gospel that Jesus was preaching in Capernaum, that he was in the synagogue, that he was talking with local fishermen who were Jewish men. But we also know from the Gospel that he was increasingly approached by those who were not Jews, foreigners, Samaritans, members of the Roman occupying forces, people from the surrounding countries. Now, in our first lesson, we learned that Jesus entered a house in the region of Tyre, which is in modern Lebanon, northwest of Palestine. For reasons unspecified, Jesus is anxious that his visit is kept secret. However, the visit is not unnoticed, and a Gentile woman, a foreigner of Syrio-Phoenician origin, it says. Uh, the Phoenicians traced their ancestry to the people of Crete, that island in the uh, Mediterranean south of Greece. And anyway, the Syrio-Phoenician woman, the foreign woman, sees Jesus and begs him to heal her sick little girl who has an unclean spirit, possibly what we would now call epilepsy. Jesus is reluctant and perhaps rather harshly to our ears comments that the children, his own people, should be fed first before the dogs, non-Jews. And remember too that dogs were unclean animals to the Jews. Sounds very hard. But the woman rather drolly remarks that even the dogs eat up the crumbs under the table. Jesus sees the point. 
and perhaps this shows his sense of humor. And he dismisses the woman, telling her that her daughter is healed. And this incident is followed by an account of another healing of someone who could well have been a Gentile, here in the country that's known as the Decapolis, literally ten towns, to the east of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus heals a man who has a serious speech impediment and is also deaf. Again, Jesus wants to keep this a secret, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Jesus wasn't just for the chosen people. And one of the most exciting parts of reading the Gospels is tracing the way in which Jesus opens up his ministry to non-Jews. We read of him talking to a Samaritan woman by a well, healing a Samaritan leper and using a Samaritan as the hero of his best-known parable. The Samaritans followed an older form of Judaism and Orthodox Jews considered their beliefs to be heretical and its practitioners to be enemies. We even learn of Jesus healing the servant of a Roman centurion, no less, a member of the hated occupying forces. Jesus must surely have borne in mind the words in the writings of the book of Isaiah that the word of God is for the isles of the Gentiles in a wonderful figurative phrase. Listen to me, O coastland, pay attention, you peoples from afar, we read in Isaiah 49 echoed in the prayer of old Simeon, which we know as the Nunc Dimittis, recited when Jesus visited the temple soon after his birth. Simeon saying to the baby that Jesus will be a light to lighten the Gentiles and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Now, the debate continues after Jesus' resurrection. We heard the story from Acts of Peter and the Roman centurion Cornelius at Caesarea. Luke helpfully adds that Cornelius was an Italian, and I'm sure we've all got Italy on our minds tonight. Anyway, uh, Cornelius was a devout convert to Judaism, but he wasn't Jewish. He has, Cornelius that is, has a vision of an angel who asks him to call the apostle Paul from Joppa, where, uh, sorry, the apostle Peter from Joppa. Uh, Peter is lodging with someone called Simon, who's a tanner. Meanwhile, Peter has a vision, a strange vision, of a sheet coming down from heaven full of birds and mammals and even reptiles, lizards and snakes and so on. Peter is encouraged to eat the food, but Peter demurs. Some of this is unclean food, and as you probably know, Jewish people will not eat pork, and they won't eat things like shellfish, uh, crustaceans like lobsters and shrimps, or mollusks like oysters and scallops. Not so in the vision. What God has made clean, you mustn't call profane. And the episode's repeated three times. The story continues with the emissaries of Cornelius arriving in Joppa, and Peter inviting them in, despite them being Romans. They then all, Peter included, return to Caesarea to the house of Cornelius. And Peter explains to Cornelius that he has been guided to speak with him. And to reach the bottom line, Peter baptizes Cornelius and notes that no one can withhold the water of baptism from anyone, Jew or Gentile, who has received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. These old strictures about clean and unclean, circumcision and uncircumcision and so on, are superseded in the new world of Jesus. Jesus is reaching out from beyond a sort of exclusive group. We find a similar decision, incidentally, in the strand of the early church's history concerning Paul, where Paul, after a particularly frustrating time in Corinth, read Acts 18 if you're interested, makes the momentous decision to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles, says Paul. Our understanding is that the original followers of Jesus were almost all Jews. That the Jesus people, as perhaps they might have been called today, saw themselves as a grouping within Judaism. 
It must have been a hard decision for those early Jesus people to reach out to non-Jews, to Gentiles, to the world outside. No longer were they members of an exclusive privileged group, part of a time-honored chosen people. The Gentiles, who had been regarded with suspicion, regarded as outsiders, were now to be embraced as fellow disciples of Jesus, as fellow citizens in the kingdom. And that must have been hard, and we know from various episodes in the New Testament writings, particularly in Acts, that there were a lot of tensions, there were a lot of disagreements, and there were a lot of problems. Nothing changes. That we, of course, as non-Jewish people, are the inheritors of that legacy of reaching out is something for which we're grateful today. Of course, the Jesus people, the early church, saw themselves in turn as the new Israel, the new chosen people. I've just finished reading uh, a book that some of you may have seen reviewed in Reform called The Journey to the Mayflower by Stephen Tompkins, who's the editor of Reform. It's a fairly learned book, but it's not unreadable, about the development of Puritanism in the 16th and early 17th century in England and Scotland and the Netherlands. Each little separatist group splitting, uniting, redividing, quarreling, squabbling, persecuting each other, saw themselves as an exclusive elect body, a new chosen people. Somehow the wider vision, with tolerance and an accepting understanding, seemed almost totally to have escaped them. As I said to Liz when I'd finished reading it, it was a story of one group of bigots chasing another group of bigots and persecuting each other mutually. But the story is very interesting. For us, we can accept that we are a chosen people insofar as we are Jesus' disciples, and that is an enormous privilege. We are a chosen people. But it also brings with it a need to reach out to embrace those who are outside of the club. Too often, Christians have been reluctant to bring in those from outside. It means for us accepting the challenges of those who are different in so many different ways. Race, education, background, gender, sexuality, age, social class, upbringing. Jesus, in his ministry, accepted the Samaritan, the foreigner, the Syrio-Phoenician woman, to give her her long name, the Roman, as well as the woman, the child, the taxman, the adulteress, and many others. It seems from what we heard from Mark earlier that this may not have been that easy for Jesus and his followers. But Jesus took the courageous step to embrace the outsider, and the step was made, and we too must make that step too. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We shall be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion in a few moments, but beforehand, let us just uh, listen while we uh, hear the hymn number 610, Beloved, Let Us Love, for Love is of God. It's a paraphrase of words from John's first letter. <laughs> Thank you. 
hear the gracious words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Him who comes to me, I will never cast out. O taste and see that the Lord is good. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Peace be with you. And if you're ever at ease, we can't take you to the Cook family for prayer. We hear now again the hymn number 2454, which is Let All Mortal Flesh Be Silent. <coughs> 454. Here again the story of the institution of the Lord's Supper as it was recorded by the Apostle Paul. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We take these very symbolic morsels of bread and cups of wine and I'll ask Michael if he will distribute them now. So if you could take one, uh, these little pods. I think most of you may be familiar with them. Um, but please don't open them until I tell you to.
before we participate in the elements, we say a prayer of thanksgiving. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord, for it is right to give the Lord thanks and praise. With joy we give you thanks and praise, almighty God, source of all life and love, that we live in your world and that you are always creating and sustaining it by your power, and that you have made us so that we can know and love you and trust and serve you. <coughs> we give you thanks that you love the world so much that you gave your only Son so that everyone who has faith in him may not die but have eternal life. We thank you that Jesus was born among us, that he lived our common life on earth. He suffered and died for us, that he rose again, and that he is always present, resurrection life, through the Holy Spirit. We thank you that we can live in the faith that your kingdom will come, and that in life and beyond life in death, you are with us. Therefore, with all the company of heaven, and with all your people, of all places and times, we proclaim your greatness and sing your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord God, by what we do here in remembrance of Christ, we celebrate his perfect sacrifice on the cross and his glorious resurrection. We declare that he is Lord of all and we proclaim for his coming in his kingdom. We pray that through your Holy Spirit, this bread may be for us the body of Christ and this wine as the blood of Christ. Accept our sacrifice of praise and as we eat and drink at his command, join us to Christ as one in him and give us strength to serve you in the world. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, as we have heard, took bread, and when he had given thanks, as we have given thanks, he broke it, saying, This body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, the cup. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, if you peel the top of these pods, uh, you should uh, reveal a little wafer. If your fingers are all thumbs. And when you have the wafer, take eat. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. And if we peel the second fragment, which I think is a little easier, you will open up, carefully not to spill it, um, some fruit juice. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ, shed for you and for all. Lifeblood of Christ, <laughs> coursing through the arteries and veins of our lives. Drink of it and think on Jesus. Christ has died.
Christ is risen, in Christ shall all be made alive. Blessing and honour and glory and power be to our God for ever and ever. Most gracious God, we praise you for what you have given and for what you have promised us here. You have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Now we give ourselves to you, and we ask that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom, and that our love may be your love, reaching out into the life of the world. And as we are still joined around this table, we bring our prayers of intercession. We think especially of the woman in the hospital bed at Colchester General with an uncertain diagnosis, worried about her family, worried about those at home, some of whom she is caring. We think of the girls in a school in Kabul, frightened that a resurgence of the Taliban may mean that their quality of life, their living their hopes of a brighter, better future will be destroyed. We think of the elderly man in a care home in Halstead, confused, neglected by his family, kept alive only by friends. We think of the teacher who has developed long COVID. <coughs> Not certain what the prognosis is. Not certain when she will recover. We think of the homeless man on the streets of Colchester as the font of goodwill that was associated with the first lockdown and the extra care and resources provided seem to be drying up. We think of the couple in Eight Ash Green who just welcomed a new baby, a little bit frightened of the sleepless nights the dirty nappies, the endless bawling, but deep in their hearts rejoicing at the excitement and the expectations of nurturing someone new within their household. We think of ourselves, concerned, worried, happy, looking forward, looking back, striving to be disciples of Christ, striving to be co-workers in the <coughs> kingdom, striving to show the fruits of the Spirit, love and tolerance and understanding and hope, forgiveness, forbearance. Be with all, we pray, be with our world, be with our nation, be with our society, be with our communities. Be with us as we work to be your people. This prayer, with the secret prayers of our hearts, we offer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Final hymn is number 603. 
it's a good hymn to end any service on. It looks back, it looks forward. Timothy Dudley Smith, incidentally, is 95. He's still writing hymns. Um, he's a member of uh, my college, and every year I get the College Gazette, and he's published a new collection. I think this is one of his best. Number 603, <coughs> Lord for the Years. <laughs> great and greatly to be praised. Awaken us to delight in your praises, for you made us for yourselves, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest <coughs> in you. Christian people, go in peace to reach out to God's world and God's creation. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and rest with you always. Amen.